Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Today we start a special series that will last for a number of weeks, and our topic is going to be celebrating Canadian-American friendship. Uh, some weeks ago, this symposium was held at North Idaho College under the auspices of the North Idaho College Popcorn Forum and Convocation Series. And while they were in town, we were very privileged to have them uh, interviewed for this program. So over the next few weeks, I'm sure our Canadian friends and, and also our uh, residents of the United States both will uh, enjoy these programs and we can celebrate our great friendship between these two great countries. On the first program, we're so pleased to welcome to the program uh, a person very, very qualified to deal with our subtopic today, which is meeting our Canadian neighbors. Our guest is Dr. Paul Alskamp. He has a PhD. Uh, he holds a baccalaureate and master's degree from Western Ontario and a PhD from the University of Rochester, all in the field of philosophy. He has spent over 25 years as an administrative president of institutions. He is the president emeritus of Western Washington University and Bowling Green State University, and he was the interim president at the University of uh, South Dakota, as well as uh, Mayville State College in North Dakota. Uh, he also was born in Montreal, Canada, is a uh, native of Canada, now living in the United States. Uh, it's a real special privilege to start our series with you, Dr. Olskamp, and I want to congratulate you and thank you for this very inspiring speech you gave at our symposium. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce our panel is Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho, and Erna Reinhardt, who is the director of public relations at North Idaho College. And Janelle will start today's questioning. My first question will actually be a two-part question. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, because you are very definitely Canadian, and um, then, but you live in the United States now. And then, se second part of the question is, would you please? talk a little bit about history in the western part of the, Uni of the United States and Canada and make some comparisons, just very briefly. Well, briefly, my own uh, history is uh, very simple. I, I, was I was born in Montreal, lived in mostly in the east, in Ontario. I grew up primarily in the city of Sudbury, about 250 miles north of Toronto. Uh, uh, University of Western Ontario was in London, Ontario, and I got two degrees there, and then came down to the University of Rochester in 1960 to work on my PhD. And I, in, in one sense, never went home professionally because other than my early working in, in various kinds of summer jobs, uh, ever since I've been employed in the U.S. by universities. My first job was at Ohio State. Uh, then I went to Roosevelt University in Chicago and then to Syracuse University as vice chancellor and then to president of Western Washington University and back to Ohio. 13 years at Bowling Green, and then the two interim things that Tony mentioned. And then I moved back to uh, Bellingham, to Western Washington, because when I left the first time to go to take over at Bowling Green, the trustees, in a, in a, I'm sure, a flush of mistaken enthusiasm, gave me <laughs> lifetime tenure and said I could come back anytime I wanted. So I did. I went back and I taught for five more years, taught philosophy at Western Washington. And then my son and my daughter uh, moved here, uh, like to my son is in Post Falls. My daughter was in Liberty Get Lake, now she's moved to Denver. But I decided, well, I'll come over here. So I bought a lot here and I built a house two years ago here in Coeur d'Alene. And as they said, I'm, I've, he lived happily, happily ever after. So you've been both Canadian and American. What about settlement of the uh, early settlement of uh, the western United States and the western part of Canada? Well, one of the things I tried to point out in my uh, talk on Monday was that um, the differences in the two cultures are dramatically reflected in the differences in the way the two sections of the country were settled. And by that time, there was a pretty firm border between the United States and Canada, um, and uh, even though it was pretty porous, but the Canadians were far less in number and far less diverse in population even then. And they had no kind of policy of expropriation of Indian lands. Um, they moved west, not militarily. There were no Indian uh, white man wars in Canada. The closest thing that ever happened to that was the Riel Rebellion 
And there was one person killed in this rebellion. And then Riel ran away to the United States. Foolishly, he came back a few years later to Saskatchewan. The Mounties caught him and they hung him, which is one reason why Riel is a super patriot. He's in Quebec today. He was French speaking and Roman Catholic, and his captors were Anglican and uh, English speaking. And there you go, same old story. But there were no Indian wars in Canada. Uh, there was uh, peace because the fur trading companies wanted it that way, particularly the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company. In the United States, after the, particularly after the Civil War, there was a gigantic rush of population westward. I think in 1849, if I'm not mistaken, 300,000 people came to the Oregon Territory. That was more people than there were in the Dominion of Canada. It wasn't a Dominion then. didn't get that till 1867, but there were more people there. Uh, so uh, it was complete. It, it, there were it was genocide down here. I mean, uh, either in, in both intentionally and unintentionally. Unintentionally, with the importation of smallpox, which wiped out 25 percent of the Plains Indians on one occasion, and then through a lot of other diseases, another 25 percent over the next 30 years. One result today is that in Canada, you will find that on a per capita basis, Canada, Canada has three times the Indian population that the U.S. does. Uh, it was also a place for Indians to seek refuge. I mean, Sitting Bull famously ran to Canada after the Battle of the Little Bighorn because he knew the blue coats would be coming back again. Um, the Canadian Pacific Railway was first built uh, under Canada's first Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald, as a direct result of the threat of the Northern Army after the Civil War. Uh, resolutions had been introduced in Congress many times, both prior to the Civil War, the first during the Revolutionary Congress, uh, and several of them after the Civil War, to, to go and get Canada, go and conquer Canada. Uh, and as a result, the Canadian Pacific Railway was built, and that's primarily why Western expansion was undertaken in, in Canada. Now, but down here, of course, there was, Western expansion had nothing to do with the threat from the North. There wasn't any. So uh, there are a lot of differences. The populations were very different. Uh, the 90 percent of Canada's population still stems from the United Empire Loyalists uh, uh, rush into Canada during and uh, after the Revolutionary War. And the French population down here, everything's much more diverse. Things aren't as cut and dried, French versus, French versus English and French and English as they once were. But it's still true that 90 percent of the population stems from that root. Reinhardt. Welcome to the show, Paul. It's Thank great you. to have you here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about similarities and differences, and I know the one thing that comes to mind so clearly to me that the, our two countries share so well is our professional sports and our football teams and our baseball teams and our, net, our professional basketball teams. Um, and that's one thing that, that uh, just stands out to me that that's, it works so well and it just seems so natural. But there's also some very, very, very profound differences between our two countries. And the one that uh, when I was reading your speech a little while ago that, that really struck me was religion and how in the United States church and state is so separate. But historically in Canada that's been very, very different. Can you inform our, our, reader, our readers, our, our viewers about how religion um, in Canada is is prevalent. I have to say, first of all, that the CFL is really just a farm team for the <laughs> NFL. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, cousins. <laughs> uh, no, I, th I think that uh, religion and uh, the religious differences in the two countries are profound. Uh, not that one of the countries is, you know, sort of unrepentantly anti-religious, whereas the other are, is all born-again Christians. Uh, I don't. That's not true at all. It's that the origin of the different religions in the two countries from the very beginning is, is quite different and explains the way things are today. I mean, down here, a great many of the original uh, settlers in the colonies, the American colonies, were refugees from religious disputes in England and the continent. Everybody from the Huguenots on, in, in uh, uh, France and Belgium to the Methodists, the Quakers, the uh, Baptists, all of whom had trouble in England and left to come over here. And so uh, the whole tradition of a multiplicity of religious sects was established from the very beginning in, by the very nature of the diaspora of those religions from England and the continent to the United States. Well, that's not what happened in Canada at all. 
uh, first of all, the, uh, the French came, not very, and the English came actually, if you want to talk about the years, there's about eight years difference between when the first arrived and the first arrived. But w when uh, Jacques Cartier arrived at, Qu at what is now Quebec in 1654, he brought Roman Catholicism with him. And even before that time, the French Catholic Church had been sending missionaries, Jean de Brebeuf uh, and the Canadian martyrs, uh, for example, to what is now Canada, Ontario, and Quebec to try and convert the Iroquois and the Hurons. Um, that's, and that I really established as the French Canadian population br built up much larger than the English initially because of the fur trade. And, and that established Roman Catholicism because it was an established church in, in uh, France. Uh, the revolution, of course, had caused the disenfranchisement of the church as it had been historically noted. Know, know I'm talking about the French Revolution now uh, in, in France. But nonetheless, uh, at the in initiation of the popula European population settlement in Canada, it was still in place in France, in, in great power. And that established it in Canada. And, and it went on that way for several decades. Uh, and since the French were the, by, uh, by all methods of counting, the largest population in north of what is now the United States from Europe at that time. By the time the English got there and went to war with the French because they were at war in, in, in Europe at the same time, by the time the English got there, Roman Catholicism was well established in the Maritimes and, and what is now Quebec and Lower Ontario. It was only when the English got there and defeated the French and uh, then the Re Revolutionary War in the United States with the influx of United Empire Loyalists, almost 70,000 of them on a population base of less than 300,000 at that time. And then the English settlements started coming over, particularly the Scots, to what are now the maritime provinces, etc., that other religions got established. But mostly it was the Anglican Church, hmm. because most of them were from England. So what do you have got now? You've got, well, one state church and another state church. Uh, whereas down here, when everybody came over, you've already started off with the base of maybe a dozen religions and a commitment on the part of individuals that you can ha have whatever religion you want. So from that base, uh, today we see, as I think I mentioned in my talk, that 57% of Americans are Baptists and just 3% of Canadians. There are all kinds of sects in this country. I frankly don't know how many, but I'm willing to bet you that it's upwards of 50 or more, not in Canada, there's still three basic churches, Roman Catholicism, Anglicanism with a couple of branches off that, and the United Church of Canada, which is an amalgam of the Methodists and the bishops, uh, bishops, Meth Baptists, <laughs> Methodists hmm. and the Baptists. So uh, that explains the most profound differences. I also think that if you look at, uh, aside from Roman Catholicism, if you take Anglicanism and the United Church of Canada, they don't have the proselytizing history and, and uh, mission that, let's say, the Mormons do. There's nothing like, I mean, the only Mormons in Canada came from down here. And, and, and they work very hard at establishing new missions in Canada. But relatively speaking, they're very small compared to the, and they have a tougher time there than uh, other churches do. Another area we want to get into, and that has to do with, and again, it's on the question of public policy, uh, and it's come even to the forefront more after that terrible crime of um, uh, 2001 uh, um, in New York and uh, Washington, D.C., when the terrorists struck this country. And so we have been in a discussion about uh, how much civil liberties can you protect and also still be safe and public safety. And certainly that's been an issue in Canada for many years. So uh, I was very impressed in your address that you talked about that there's some real cultural differences in how Canadians look at how much civil liberties do you have when also you have need for public safety compared to the United States? Would you take us through that? Yes, one of the things in my, uh, in my speech that I said, and, and this is a matter of personal opinion, I don't have evidence for it, uh, though I think I could find it if I, I did enough legal research, uh, is that the Patriot Act would not be controversial in Canada, as it is, uh, among other places, here in North Idaho because uh, par portions of it are seen as an infringement upon civil rights that are guaranteed in the American Constitution. Uh, first of all, those civil rights are n have not been guaranteed in, 
any of Canada's federal documents until 1982 because Canada didn't have a constitution, properly speaking, until 1982. Uh, the British North America Act was Canada's, quote, constitution, unquote, but it, it was a British law uh, control, uh, whose revision rested in the hands of Great Britain, not Canada. Uh, and, even, and even in that act, the uh, civil liberties of individuals are, are very much curtailed uh, or non-existent compared to the American Constitution. Uh, also, if you look back to the previous question about the way w w the West was settled, one of the reasons there was so much violence in the Western settlement of, Amer of the United States was because law and order did not precede the settlers, it came afterwards. So we've got the individual sheriff and the cowboy mentality and all the rest of it. It's not the case in Canada that it's always had a federal police force. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, originally called the Royal Northwest Mounted Police. And the Mounties were always there with the original settlers all the way. They established for every single settlement in Canada, a Mountie post was established at the same time. So law and order and the preservation of good order has always been a, from the frontier backwards, a centrally important part of Canadian government and Canadian uh, political and moral belief as well. Uh, I think for that reason, Canadians have been willing to accept curtailment of civil rights that would have caused much more uh, uh, fuss down here, such as uh, curtailment of the right of free speech during the Second World War, uh, such as, uh, during the 1950s when the Mounties were opening people's mail uh, secretly in order to determine whether or not they were had associations with embassies and consulates that belonged to Russia and so on and so forth. That wouldn't have been tolerated down here and it wasn't. And even today when we deal with, and on one of the other problems we're dealing with hate groups and, and comparing the two countries what's happened, uh, hate speech is more restricted it's in illegal. Canada than the United States. It's illegal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like shouting fire in a theater. Mm -hmm. Whereas down here, you got to wait till the theater burns down before you go get the bad guys. Now, you know, there's things to be said on both sides. It's, it's very hard to speak about curtailing speech, uh, hate speech. Where do you draw the division? If, is, it, is it hate when you say, I don't like him because he's a Jew? Or is it hate speech when you say, I want to kill all the Jews? Or when you say, and this is a famous case in Canada, there was no such thing as the Holocaust. That was the claim by a publisher in the West, which led to the law in Canada that made that uh, a crime. Okay, thank you. Janelle Burke. I've had the pleasure of looking at your address, and um, it, it's very interesting that a lot of the people who live in Canada live very close to the United States. And so can you share with our viewers the percentage of Canada, uh, Canadian citizens that l live so close to the United States? Well, in terms of absolute numbers, it's, a, it's approximately um, 199 to 200 Canadians uh, out, of, uh, out of all Canadians uh, live within 100 miles of the U.S. border. Uh, all of my family does. And I, I, I was... Uh, I, I guess I did too. I, I, even though I was 250 miles, miles north of Toronto, if you had drawn a line from Sudbury, Ontario to Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, it would be about 175 miles long. So I did too. So Canadians live very close to the United States. Another mm -hmm. thing that you indicated was that there's a difference in how Canadians view heroes. And uh, you remarked about how much you were influenced as a child by uh, things that were uh, it come, came from the United States, um, programs and so forth. Would you share that with the viewers? I thought it was very entertaining. I thought, <clears throat> when I, in hindsight, of course, uh, since I didn't know any better when I was growing up, uh, I didn't grow up having almost any Canadian heroes other than athletes. Hockey players were, were my heroes. The occasional football player. I remember one of them was my uh, real hero for the Edmonton Eskimos until I found out his name was Johnny Bright. I found out he graduated from Drake University in Iowa. And, played <laughs> <laughs> so, and he was black. <laughs> uh, and, I, so, and that was rare in those days. Uh, so, but they were my heroes. Otherwise, my heroes were people like Winston Churchill, who, after all, is not a Canadian, even though his wife, uh, his mother, rather, was an American. Uh, 
and I and, and I had some political heroes. Uh, later in my life, before I emigrated to the United States and became an American, uh, Pierre Trudeau for, was became prime minister about the time that I came down here. I was a great admirer of Trudeau. I admired his intelligence, his wit, his determination, uh, his his philosophical views of what Canada was all about. But aside from that, I didn't have very... Mike Pearson was something of a hero for me because he won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, but I didn't have very many heroes other than that. But, but I had lots of American heroes. I mean, I, uh, because I was very interested in the Second World War, I knew a great deal about generals that were officers in the American Army. Canada had generals too, but the only one I knew anything about was a fellow named McLaughlin. And uh, he, he was in charge of Canadian troops during the Normandy invasion. But I didn't know anything else about them, and we weren't taught that in school. We were taught a great deal about civic life in the United States. We weren't taught very much uh, about Canada. Um, if, I, I mean, we, we were taught the basics of the settlement of the country, Radisson and Grosselier, the original uh, French trappers who got the Hudson's Bay Company founded. We used to call them radishes and galoshes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and Jean Cabot and Cartier and all of those things. But we weren't taught them as though they were heroes. We weren't told about their travails. We weren't told about their, uh, the hardships they endured. Uh, whereas when we, taught, when we learned about America, sometimes just through the movies, I mean, there are all these guys on horses that go for 10 days hunting down the bad guys. Uh, and that's the kind of mythology I grew up with. I'm always intrigued with the education system. And, and you've got a long history of working in higher education. So I just want to ask a, a question about some of the similar, similarities and differences in, in education system. And maybe just briefly talk about K through 12 and then the higher education systems. And, maybe a little bit about people's attitudes towards higher education or education and the differences between the two countries there. I think there are um, very significant dif differences which have narrowed somewhat in, since I was uh, growing up. For example, in the province of Ontario and several other provinces, at one point there were five years of, of high school. The last year was called upper school or grade 13. And, there, and you could earn a bachelor's degree in three years. It was called a general degree. Uh, at university, and that's what I did. I had five years of high school and earned a three-year degree as my initial degree. Um, I, I, the lower school system, I don't recall a great deal about it. I, I attended uh, Roman Catholic schools and uh, went from Roman Catholic school directly into public high school. Um, I did not think that I had very good teachers in the public high school nor did I think I got a very good education, but that may have been because I was a bit of a disciplinary problem and would rather have played football and hockey and other things than have been in the classroom. Uh, I thought the undergraduate education I got at university was first class and still do, and in fact I think it was better and still do than the average undergraduate degree education in the United States with the institutions I know about. Are those government-funded higher education colleges and universities like ours are? All, no, yeah, well, there's big differences. Uh, every university in Canada is uh, funded by the government, whether they're private or public, uh, oh, wow. and to the same extent on a per capita basis. It's very much harder to become a university in Canada. You have to have a federal charter, just like a bank, to do it. And there are very few banks. There are 13 banks in Canada with all kinds of branches, but there's still only 13 uh, banks because of the uh, chartering law. Uh, so as one result, private schools are much better off in Canada than they are down here and, and charge lower tuition because they get as much government support on a per capita basis as public schools do. Um, graduate education in Canada, I think, uh, is much better now than it was when I was, I got an MA in Canada. Uh, but. Um, I didn't think that the resources for graduate education were as uh, significant in Canada in those days as they are now. Um, and I still believe I got a better education at the undergraduate level. I think for two reasons, um, I, th I think my opinion is that for two reasons. First of all, they didn't have the sem semester or quarter system. They had a uh, system where you started out at the beginning of the year with, let's say, five or six subjects. And then you studied those subjects. 
uh, and you took a break at Christmas, and then you came back and you studied the same subjects. And so by the end of the year, you had one full year of significantly in-depth, I mean twice the depth, as you would have if wow. you just stopped them all at Christmas and started them again. And, uh, and that really worked for me, um, and I think maybe for other students as well. Um, so that's one reason. The other thing is that there was nowhere nearly the emphasis in Canadian universities on, um, uh, on publication and research as a reward for professors. I mean, you did get rewarded if you did that, but they, they really paid attention to means of developing teaching evaluation, even when I was there in, in the 50s. So I, thi I think that, uh, especially at the great state universities here, in the last class at, uh, I taught at Ohio State was at 8 o'clock in the morning with 800 students in it. And I had six graduate assistants as well. Now, you know, I spent most of my time just trying to keep them awake. <laughs> you know, so, let alone trying to the, explain the intricacies of Aristotle to them. Uh, so I got a better education there, I think. Time is very short, but there's something else that uh, is terribly important that's come out of this symposium is um, that Canadians are very aware of uh, much about America. I would say almost every Canadian knows who the President of the United States is. When you ask Americans who the Prime Minister of Canada is, a very small percentage can tell you and you have a new prime minister, or, or the Canada has recently. Uh, why haven't we been more willing to learn about Canada than Canadians about us? Oh, I think the answer is simply that on a, I don't care what time you take, whether it's daily or weekly or monthly or yearly, w w the impact of Canada just isn't as visible on this country as the impact of America is. When's the last time you can remember seeing a Canadian TV program down here? can't avoid them in the North. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, nobody reads the so, Globe and Mail down here. Half of Canada reads the New York Times. So the exposure is so different. Yes. On that note, uh, Dr. Olskamp, let me the permanent conclusion. It's been a delight to start this series out with you, and uh, you're such a highly educated person, and I failed to mention at the beginning of the program you're an author and, you know, and, and, and done a lot of writing, and we're just very honored to have you on the program and to have you speak at this symposium. Uh, and we are so proud you've chosen to live in this community, and your spouse as well. She's doing some wonderful things in the community, uh, and we hope you'll be back with us again at some future time. I've been honored, and I'd be delighted. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll continue to watch this series. It's a rather long series and a very wonderful one, celebrating Canadian-American friendship. We will continue that next week with program number two in this series. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.